Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox team, uh, or CCAST for short. My name is Matt Graybaugh, and I'm the Science Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program and Federal Co-Director of CCAST, along with Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, the CCAST team launched the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community Practice in early 2020 to facilitate information sharing through webinars and workshops and to develop decision support tools to help us address uh, introduced aquatic species in the West. Not going to provide too much more information on that, but if you'd like more information on the community of practice, uh, feel free to uh, email myself or Christy, and we'll put our email addresses in the chat, and it looks like Christy has done that already. So with that, I think I'm done talking, and I'll hand it over to Christy. Thanks, Matt. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christy Miner. I work with the CCAST team here at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I joined CCAST a couple months ago as the new coordinator of the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Today we are hosting a presentation from Jimmy Gragg and Daniel Eddington, who will discuss the application of a common threats lexicon by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Jimmy is the Wildlife Action Plan Project Leader for Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and has worked in this position since 2008. In previous work, he's worked to fill data gaps and manage threats to a host of imperiled non-game species and their habitats in various locations. Daniel is the Habitat Conservation Coordinator for the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. He's worked for the division since 2004 in several positions that monitored big game winter ranges, managed wildlife management areas, and completed habitat restoration projects for wildlife in Utah. So just a final reminder, um, before I turn it over to Jimmy, if you have questions during the presentation, please just enter them in the chat box and I will relay them uh, to the speakers afterwards. And with that, I think Jim Jimmy, we are ready for you. Okay, I found the unmute button. <laughs> well, um, thanks for having me. I'm um, excited to come share some stuff back with you guys. I've enjoyed um, joining the CCAST um, community and have been through a few webinars. And, um, and actually, that's what led me to want to bring this. I sort of intuited that a, a common um, interest or concern of many attendees um, kind of boiled down to how do I get my project funded? And um, you can you can take that pretty simply, or you can let it get all complicated. And uh, as, as a biologist, I like to complicate things. So um, so here we are. But uh, <laughs> so this is a two-parter. I'm going to talk first. Daniel will follow. I'm just going to give some background, kind of uh, that that helps explain um, or contextualize what what Daniel will also provide. So um, there's the title slide. <laughs> Let me get out, try to advance. There we go. Um, and so, uh, you know, here's uh, my and Daniel's uh, names, titles, uh, where we work. And here's a picture of the project area that, uh, that Daniel will um, tell his story about in a big, year, big flood year of 2011. But um, at the top there, it's kind of an alternative title. Um, basically, identifying common interests helps pool conservation resources. And over a 30-year career, I've really come to believe that. So hopefully, um, I can make my case. And uh, if you don't know that yet, um, you'll come away believing it too. So I've got a few slides telling you what I'm going to tell you. Um, first of all, you, many of you guys, I, I've intuited that you, a lot of you guys aren't in state uh, agencies. So um, a little bit about the, the what and why of a state wildlife action plan or a swap. And um, drilling into a little bit of the detail in there, there the, one of the eight required elements is a description of problems, da da da, we call that the threats and data gaps required element. There is a voluntary best practices document that uh, many of us you know, voluntarily followed and there's some, some specific material pertaining to that required element three about threats and data gaps. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Utah's wildlife action plan identifies as, as our biggest threats and data gaps to our species, the greatest conservation need and their key habitats. 
And then finally, um, there's a transition to Daniel's um, portion of the talk, a little bit on uh, why, I put in quotes, it takes a village <laughs> to address these problems and how the common lexicon and the metric um, help to rally and steer the village to address uh, the problems and, and data gaps. So um, a little bit about swaps. Um, I always like to start with why and um, annoyingly, I often don't stop asking why and well, um, so here's the why, the, 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 the fundamentally successful wildlife management absolutely requires reliable funding. And in our nation, uh, historically, it's been the most successful when the states and the feds pitch in on that funding. Um, however, most states through most of the previous century um, provided little or no funding to manage non-game species. And um, I posit that the re results were predictable and those were numerous uh, species declines um, indeed followed by some extinctions. And um, unlike with sport fish or game species or um, nature species act listed wildlife species, uh, species wildlife species without such, such designations also um, lacked a Fish and Wildlife Service funding stream for pretty much the entire 20th century. And there are a few exceptions, um, you know, uh, the migratory birds um, for a few years raised small potatoes, but um, mostly, you know, I, I think this is true. And that's not to overlook the important support that Congress has seen fit to provide via other agencies, such as um, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, um, but still, um, Fish and Wildlife Service is, is the wildlife agency for the nation and uh, not having reliable non-game funding provided via Fish and Wildlife Service has been um, an impediment to managing most wildlife in the nation. So, uh, you know, with so many species declines and some extinctions, um, stakeholders, um, you know, justifiably pitched a fit. It's, you know, it's their stuff and it's getting wrecked and they weren't happy. So they did what they do. Uh, Congress took notice eventually and they created the State Wildlife Grants Program, which um, is, <laughs> it's unauthorized and it's annually appropriated. So it's kind of um, not that reliable, but, uh, but it's been around for about 15 years. So yay, sweet. So that's the justification. And drilling down to the purpose, um, you can put this a couple of ways. There's, uh, you can just put it like administratively or bureaucratically. Um, if a state wants to get the state wildlife grants, they need to have a swap. And that was the appropriations law passed in 2002. Um, another way to put it is um, it's, there's an aspirational purpose to, to reduce the rate of new ESA listings. And the context of the late 80s and early 90s is important here. Remember the law was passed in 2002. Um, and in the preceding decade, decade and a half, there was a veritable tidal wave of ESA listings. Um, a lot of them were really high profile. Um, you may know of red cockaded woodpeckers in the Southeast and some of their effects on military um, testing and training for a little while. <laughs> um, desert tortoise in the Southwest and its effects on things like um, livestock grazing, um, and of course, all of the Salmonids in the Northwest and the Columbia, Klamath, Sacramento drainages. I mean, you know, five or six species, all the seasonal runs, you know, lots of listed fish. And its effects on hydropower, irrigation, you know, culinary water provision, just uh, anyway, big deal. The listings really got people's attention. So that's where this came from. So the purpose of the swaps explicitly in Utah is to manage native wildlife species and their habitats sufficient to prevent the need for additional listings under the ESA. And that's what we just, we say that it's explicit. And then implicitly um, working with partners and staff, you know, we all kind of know it's a, it's a strat plan and it's supposed to provide leadership to guide, um, you know, conservation to maintain the full array of Utah's wildlife. And so drilling down further, there's, requirements of a swap in order to get that state wildlife grants money. And there are eight required elements. Um, the last three are just procedural. The first five are substantive though. And one of those five, again, is required element three concerning threats and data gaps. And so 
I mentioned this best practices document. There's a screen grab on the right of the, of the, of the cover of it. And uh, again, it's, you know, required element three is descriptions of problems affecting species and habitats and priority research and survey efforts. Or as we shorthand it down, it's the threats and data gaps required element. So if you open up the uh, best practices doc to the right little chapter section, you get into the threat section and you can la, 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 use this thing, standard lexicon, da, 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 da. And then I've circled this bit at the end here, consistency across the swaps will facilitate identifying shared threats across states and contribute to more focused conservation actions. And the point of this talk is um, it's not to refute that, but it's to generalize it uh, not only across states, but even within, within a state, across organizations, within an organization, within an agency, um, and then certainly among agencies, among organizations. Um, so that's, that's my point. So you know, how do you identify the biggest threats? Um, that common lexica or the, uh, the best practices thing said, you know, categorize your threats, you know, give them a name, use the same name, you know, don't use five different names for the same thing. That's, that's important. Language matters for communication, but uh, a label without a metric isn't, isn't that great. So we used um, the nature serve methodology to calculate threat impact. That's a combination of scope and severity and scope is a, is, a, is a spatial thing, like, you know, how, how much of the distribution of this thing is affected, and the severity is, is kind of an intensity thing, like, um, you know, within the next decade, what are the chances of wiping it out, uh, you know, statewide? So combine those two things, you get the threat impact. The threat impact ranges from low, to medium to high, to very high. So I mentioned the nature serve network, it's worth stopping. Um, the other stuff and just just talking about that a little bit um in utah we have our natural heritage program it's a member of the nature surf network and the natural heritage uh, heritage programs and nature surf operate um the, the fifth generation of this database biotics five and the the important thing to know here is um that's a place where um you can record your data about you know uh what what threats are affecting uh, species in natural communities and how bad the impacts of those threats are. And there's, uh, when I made the slide, there were 80 member programs across the hemisphere. And here's a, a continental U.S. depiction of where they are, um, where they're located. So you see nobody's missing one. And uh, over half are in state government somewhere, not necessarily the wildlife agency, not, not at all necessarily that, although it is the case in Utah, but um, they can be in other departments or their own special standalone thing in state government, but about a quarter are in universities. And so the whole, you know, Eastern tier of the Rockies, basically um, just about uh, their universities, like I know in Colorado, it's at CSU in Fort Collins. Um, and then there's just a few oddballs, like there's a, there's a, you know, Tennessee Valley Authority natural heritage program. Anyway, the point is you've all got a heritage program uh, to, to possibly partner with, and that, that's important. And then continentally or uh, hemispherically, you can see they're, they're in most of the new world. So that's kind of fun. It's helpful for migratory uh, taxa, especially birds and bats and you know, some sea turtles and stuff that uh, we share with uh, folks down in the Southern Hemisphere. So again, um, in, in Utah are identifying the biggest threats. We use the standardized language and the metric, and that enabled us to be able to compare threats that affect multiple species and habitats. And um, you know, the, the, so what? It's, it's cool because we can see that most threats are fairly trivial. I mean, they may affect many targets, many species and habitats, um, but you know, mostly very, very, very trivial, or they can be acute, but very local. Um, or they may, you know, very badly impinge on um, a few targets. And that's that's most. But a few target, a few threats rather, are um, are both, you know, ubiquitous and existential, impacting many species and habitats statewide badly. And uh, and these are really the shared top priorities. And so here's a frequency histogram. Um, the threats 
lexicon is, is hierarchical. Um, this is the most general level, level one. And so you can see um, some of the, the threats like geological events is that one that barely even registers. Um, natural systems modifications, if you can't read it, that's the biggest um, column over 400 um, in instances of, of threats impacting our species or habitats in our wildlife action plan um, are from natural systems modifications. And you'll see the second highest one right next to the, 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 the most highest one. <laughs> well, the, the tallest multicolor one, that's invasive and other problematic species and genes. So, and the one off to the far right, that's data gaps. Those aren't um, ranked. There's no very high versus low impact data gap. Data gaps are just, just data gaps. So drilling down a little further, again, in that second highest um, occurring uh, threat, the, uh, in, in the orange row, they're invasive and other problematic species and genes. You can see the, the yellow rows are the next level down in the hierarchy. And then the white rows are nested within each of the yellow rows above. So in that second yellow row, invasive non-native species, the, that, and that's the level two threat, there are five level three threats that we identified here. Um, you know, alien disease organisms, feral domestics, uh, alien bugs, uh, invasive plants, invasive wildlife. And the numbers again pertain to how many times that threat affected a species of greatest conservation need or a key habitat in our wildlife action plan. And so you can also see what I was saying before about, um, you know, some things are relatively trivial but affect a lot of targets and other things are like ubiquitous and existential. And so this helps with prioritization and communicating across Stove pipes within your agency, across agencies, across geographies, um, across time. Pretty handy. And drilling down even further and, and showing you this data in a slightly different way. So you've got the level one, level two, and then the level three threats there in orange, yellow, and green, respectively. But I played with my pivot table and I'm showing you just the amphibians and the aquatic key habitats uh, that these threats affect. And so that's why there's 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 only a one in a box in the um, in the white rows. Uh, anyways, again, it's a pretty handy way to summarize and communicate data. Also, um, if you do this more than once, <laughs> you can monitor the uh, the impact of threats. So you know the scope or severity or both of a threat will change through time, whether because, you know, um, intrinsic reasons uh, or, you know, human activities, maybe it gets worse um, or with management, maybe it gets better. And that's what we're trying to do after all, right? Make, make the threat less bad. So this is a way of um, tracking at a course scale, um, whether you're doing any good. So that's nice, right? Um, so I, I recommend this. <laughs> So again, here um, nearing the end, shared language and metrics help identify who creates, who regulates, or who hosts. And I just call that who owns, <laughs> who owns the problems? Because you're not gonna manage the problems without dealing with the owner. Um, it helps to identify shared problems across um, even like diverse interests. And um, it's worth pointing out, it's. Invasives are not a good case, but certainly in the case of some of the other threats, um, you need to remember, you kind of got to watch your mouth. Like, um, you know, what we call a threat, you know, might be a way that somebody, you know, feeds their family or provides um, essential <laughs> social services. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, you may, you may call water development a threat, but, you know, try going a weekend without water. It's, uh, it, it's no fun. Um, and so the shared language metrics also help to recognize and communicate importance or priority among geographies, taxonomic groups, habitat types, among organizations, agencies, among states, anything, just among human communities. So it's um, a pretty handy thing to, to do. So once again, you know, how do you do this? You could get with your natural heritage program because using their Biotics 5 system, you know, the, the threats are all in there and they track species and habitats and they, 
record, you know, what you think the threat impact was, the scope and severity. So, um, and, and, they, and there's like, you know, versioning. So you can look back, you know, what did we say last time? Or what did we say the time before that? They track all that stuff. So if you're not familiar with and, and consulting with them and using them, you're missing out. You really are. Okay, and that's it for me. I will stop sharing and turn it over to Daniel. All right, thanks. Everybody see that? Yep, it looks good. All right. So yeah, I'm Daniel Eddington. I'm with the Division of Wildlife, and I'm just going to give a brief background about Utah's Watershed Restoration Initiative, and then I'll kind of give an example of a project that came through that process uh, down on the Colorado River near Moab, Utah. So Utah's Watershed Restoration Initiative, uh, a lot of times we call it WRI, it's a state-led partnership-driven effort uh, aimed to improve high-priority watersheds in Utah. So on the right there, you can see the logos of several of the partners in this program. Um, I mainly just have the large uh, landowner logos up, but on any given year, we can have uh, up to 80 different funding partners um, through our restoration initiative that are partners on projects. And since its launch about 15 years ago, uh, WRI and its partners have restored nearly 2 million acres. So primarily there's three ecosystem values that we focus on, um, watershed health and biological diversity, water quality and yield, and then opportunities for sustainable uses of natural resources. So there's a lot of benefits to, to being partners. Um, and I just came up with a few of here on the slide of what partners benefit by being a part of our uh, WRI uh, initiative. And so one, there's locally led regional teams. So in Utah, there's five locally led teams. They comprise of state, federal, NGO, and private groups. Um, projects are developed um, from the bottom up. So these groups are developing projects within their teams. Um, they rank the projects within their teams and they pass this up to the administration uh, for funding recommendation. Now with the collaboration, we have matching dollars because all of the different groups uh, are collaborating and coming together to develop projects. They all have different funding sources. And so federal, state, NGO, um, all provide funding for projects, um, which is essentially helping us do cross boundary projects. Uh, historically, you know, we'd have a BLM would do a project, they would hit a land ownership boundary of, you know, forest service, state or private, and the the project would end there, even though the ecosystem values extended onto those neighboring lands. And so with everybody collaborating, we've been able to eliminate a fair amount of that uh, project just stopping at the uh, boundary ownership. Um, project planning and management, um, just by bringing multiple people together, multiple skill sets, different expertise, we tend to get way better projects. Historically, we would have you know, a project that was brought just for a particular species. Um, that's very unusual now. Most projects are coming with multiple partners and multiple species being benefited. And by doing that, we just see a much more watershed type uh, issues being addressed and uh, restored in an, in an ecosystem. So, uh, there's just a lot of benefits to planning the project with multiple people, and then you also have help managing it on the ground. Um, contract and accounting. Um, a lot of times when you're trying to do restoration projects, there's always tends to be bottlenecks that pop up. Um, one we've encountered for a long time was archaeology, working with a lot of the federal agencies. They just, that was what was restricting projects from coming forward. And so one way the initiative helped resolve that is that right now the state of Utah through our purchasing process is doing a lot of the archeology span surveys for a lot of the federal agencies. Um, 
we do a lot of contracting for all of the different practices. Um, uh, anything that a project needs to be done, we can help uh, with the contracting. I gave a few examples here that we've done on some of the uplands, but um, we do contracting for whatever needs to be done. And so all of that's, you know, tracked, it's accounted for, um, and we provide that information uh, to the partnership. Another big benefit of this partnership is seed. Um, so a lot of projects require seed. I know that might not be as applicable to this group, but um, in Utah, we have, uh, through the Division of Wildlife, a seed warehouse called the Great Basin Research Center. Um, we take all the projects that want seed for restoration work uh, that were approved for funding, and we do a single purchase, sometimes a double purchase for that seed, and we are able to buy it at a much bulk price that saves a lot of funding. And then through that seed warehouse, we're able to customize mix for each individual project as they requested it. Uh, and so there's a lot of benefits with uh, doing seed with a lot of the different partners. With equipment, um, a lot of restoration equipment can become very specialized and hard to access. And so through the uh, initiative, we've purchased several pieces of equipment that are free for each of the partners to use through as they bring projects through the initiative. Um, there's a lot of different types of equipment that uh, are available um, that are also stored at our Great Basin Seed Warehouse. Um, a lot of that equipment, once again, can be um, large, cumbersome type of equipment. So we do have a crew that is provides delivery of that equipment to project sites uh, free of charge. And so that's been a huge benefit um, for a lot of the partners. And then lastly, I'll just kind of mention project monitoring and reporting. Um, each project's different. They have different monitoring uh, that occurs on them. Uh, in the state of Utah, we do have uh, a range trend crew that does some vegetation type monitoring on different projects. Um, they're only limited to a small portion of projects, but um, we do have that available. Um, a lot of the different partners that are involved in the project uh, do a lot of their own monitoring as well, whether it's fuel monitoring, you know, water quality monitoring. There's a lot of that that takes place by the individual agency. We do have some projects that actually do have university type studies uh, associated with them. And then at a minimum, we, we do require before and after photos of, of the projects. So there on the right is our web-based uh, database. Uh, so all projects are proposed through a web-based uh, database that we've developed. Um, and this is just our dashboard of the proposed projects, the current projects, and then the completed. So since you know 2006, we've completed roughly 2,300 projects at roughly close to 2 million acres. And so anybody's able to get on this website, um, the project site where all the projects are kept is this wri.utah.gov. If you ever want to know more information than just about uh, the program, um, we do have this watershed.utah.gov. These two sites are interchangeable uh, on either side of the website. Um, if you click, click projects, it will kick you over to where all the projects are stored. Uh, the about us will kick you over to where all the program information is available. And then like I say, there's an interactive map. You can get on there, just look around if there's an area of interest, you can see what projects have been completed um, and zoom in uh, and click on any of the projects and it'll bring up all the project information. So with that, I just kind of want to jump over to a project that uh, came through this initiative several years ago. It actually just got wrapped up this fall, uh, but it's down on the Colorado River uh, near Moab, Utah, uh, on the Scott, Scott Matheson Wetland Preserve. I provide this picture, uh, Jimmy already kind of showed it a little bit, but this is uh, what the wetland probably historically looked like on um, probably any given year when the Colorado River floods. Uh, this was a picture taken in 2011, um, and it has not done that since 2011. So we're now in 2021 and we have not seen another flood event like that again. So on average, we're seeing uh, this wetland only flood uh, maybe once a decade or maybe even longer. 
which you know impacts a lot of different species that rely on uh, this wetland. So just a little background about the wetland. Um, it's first one of the only major wetlands in Utah on the Colorado River for you know 64 miles because most of the Colorado River is within canyon walls. Um, so this is a 875 acre preserve that was purchased by the Nature Conservancy and the Division of Wildlife. Um, the north half is owned by the Division of Wildlife. The south half is owned by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, it was purchased in 1990, and it's home to over 200 species of birds, amphibians, mammals. Um, a lot of species utilize this wetland. Um, but over the years, we're not seeing the same flood events. Um, there are portions of the wetland that do go dry and stay dry fairly consistently now. Um, just the picture up in the right-hand corner is just a historical photo of the wetland of what probably historically occurred a lot more frequent um, than it does now. And so one of the concerns we've had um, recently has been with uh, the razorback sucker. Um, this is a fish that's endemic to the Colorado Basin. It's currently protected under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it's gone, undergone wide, based on wide declines, you know, as a result, believed to be a result of human, you know, induced habitat alterations and, you know, different competition and predation from introduced non-native fish. And one of the unique things about the fish is that when it spawns, it's occurring as the Colorado River increases in floods. And so when the eggs are hatching, the larvae are flood, flowing down the river as it's flooding and finding those off-channel habitat nurseries. Well, with the preserve currently not flooding as frequently as it is or only flooding once every 10 years, um, those larvae are not able to find the, a lot of that off-channel nursery habitat. And as many of you may know, this is a large fish. It can live up to 40 years, can be up to 36 inches long. Um, so it has the capability of, of spanning multiple uh, flood frequencies. But our goal, partly with this project, was to see if we couldn't increase some of that flooding event uh, on the Matheson Preserve. Um, I just threw this slide in, um, maybe as a reference, that this wetland is also a huntable uh, area for for game species. Um, the north half of the preserve uh, is open to waterfowl hunting, turkey hunting, uh, even some uh, other types of hunting, whether pheasants or uh, even deer, perhaps with uh, some primitive weapons. But the reason I kind of bring this up is just the fact that um, it, this really opened a lot of doors for us uh, for funding opportunities. Uh, there's so many species that rely on for the water in the wetland um, that it really opened up a lot of opportunities for us to partner with different organizations, different groups, different species in order to find funding for this, the project we wanted to do uh, on the wetland. So this is kind of just an outline of what we wanted to do. Uh, since the, the wetland's not flooding as frequently, um, as it maybe historically or naturally did, uh, we wanted a way to be able to bring some of that water in from the Colorado River onto the preserve. And potentially, you know, when it's flooding and train those razorback larvae that are, were found in about 2012 to just be drifting past uh, the wetland preserve uh, and wasn't able to really provide a lot of nursery habitat for them. So we we hooked up with an engineering firm to help design a project that could potentially at least entrain fish every three out of five years. Uh, what that required was doing a new diversion structure before we just had a simple uh, turn head gate down here that didn't provide us a whole lot of control. Um, we also excavated down about three feet uh, to lower the elevation of when the Colorado floods, when we can uh, entrain water into the preserve. Um, we wanted to create this linear pond, um, which is kind of just a segue over to the larger central pond, um, which is uh, the main feature on the, the wetland that uh, holds water. So that was kind of our goal that we wanted to do with this, is to be able to bring more water into the preserve, which would benefit razorback, other non-native or other native fish species, 
as well as the waterfowl and any other, you know, amphibian mammals that that wouldn't need water on the preserve. And so by doing this, it allowed us to have some more control of the water, being able to bring it in, hope being the razorback sucker, we could hold them for a couple months uh, and then be able to release them back to the Colorado River when they got to maybe a little bit larger side and might size and might be able to survive a little bit better in the larger Colorado River uh, ecosystem. So as Jimmy kind of talked about uh, the threats and the risks um, associated with each species, we've incorporated that into our initiative. Um, so on our database, as projects are being proposed and presented, uh, they have to go through identifying the species that their project is gonna benefit. Um, and so they're using currently, as Jimmy explained, the Natural Reserve National Conservation Status Rank. So each species will have that. Um, we also have a high interest game rank uh, for the game species. And for um, each species, there's also the threats that Jimmy referred to. And all of this is incorporated into the database system. And these are used as uh, ranking criteria for uh, getting pro projects uh, funded. And so um, we've encouraged over the years um, people to begin to collaborate a lot more on threats that are affecting different species as well as the species. And so instead of just having someone come with a Razorback sucker project, we want them and encourage them to come with a larger type project that will address multiple threats to multiple different species. And that just really pushes people to think outside of the box, consider other things that could be benefited and you know, also address any issues that you know, might cause impacts to other species. And so we're just encouraging you know, folks to uh, communicate with folks maybe they don't normally communicate with. And that's really um, brought a lot of really great projects uh, to the forefront. In order to really get funding through the WRI, uh, initiative, it's almost a requirement at this point. It's not a requirement, but in order to really get funding, uh, you really need to go that route. Uh, here's just a quick drop down of the threats that are listed. So you can click on the, the threats, it'll drop them down. As Jimmy mentioned, uh, it'll list the individual, the threat and the threat impact for each of the species. So this is the Razorback sucker. These are what this project was trying to accomplish. Um, and so you can see the threat impact there for each, each species. Um, so with this project, um, what was accomplished? So what they did is they installed a new diversion structure and the new diversion structure at this point um, allows water to come into the preserve more frequently. Um, obviously not like that 2011 photo, um, but allows us to uh, bring water in which uh, we'll have the larvae of the razorback sucker and other native fishes. Um, allows them to come in. Uh, it has a fish screen that excludes large predatory fish on it. Um, and just allows us a lot more flexibility in controlling the water to and from the Colorado River. Um, as the fish are released back to the Colorado River, it also allows uh, our biologists an opportunity to work up those fish uh, if they want to install pit tag re readers into them. Uh, this new diversion allows them that kind of flexibility to be able to do that. Um, the project included some pond dredging. Um, we wanted to be able to lower uh, at least portions of the preserve to be able to receive more flood water from the Colorado River on a more regular basis. So we did some dredging um, out to the central pond um, and then created a small area in that central pond, only about two acres. Um, of where water could collect, you know, during uh, low water years. Um, and then it would also provide us a, an ability to help maintain uh, the water quality, why we do have fish in there, because that can deteriorate fairly quickly. So we installed a pipeline from some springs that we have water rights on. Um, it's about a, a 5,000 foot pipeline. Currently the pipeline, the spring water just comes into the wetland and just disperses itself. Uh, the new pipeline allows us the flexibility of, to continue just to disperse the water over the wetland or to actually uh, focus it into uh, that central pond, um, that two, this two acre pond uh, that we kind of 
dredged out uh, to help us maintain water quality for a little bit longer before we release uh, any larvae fish back into the Colorado River. So that's kind of what was accomplished with this project. This is kind of a budget funding slide of the project. Um, I bring this up just because um, initially when we wanted to do this project, we approached the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, kind of the recovery program to say, hey, we got this awesome idea of a project. They said, great, that's an awesome idea, but it doesn't really fit our priorities for funding right now. Um, and that was kind of a little bit of a letdown with the project as, as we thought it would be a great opportunity uh, as a wetland we already have uh, to try to help, uh, you know, at least that fish species. We still wanted to move forward with the project. And so it was brought through the WRI process. Um, that first phase was just engineering that allowed us to at least develop some of the project ideas and get it off the ground. Uh, you can see the different funding sources that contributed to the engineering. Uh, obviously WRI contributed to it. The Nature Conservancy has been a huge partner on this and I give them a lot of kudos for stepping up and really helping out with this project uh, as they are a, a landowner, but they did so much more in, in helping with the collaboration and the funding part of this project. Um, phase two of this was just, you know, doing some of the diversion structure and some of the dredging to get more water on the preserve. Um, some of the different partners that popped up at that point was, you know, the Division of Wildlife Habitat Council, which is essentially licensed dollars for uh, sport fish and so, or for sport, game animals. And so waterfowl is one of those species. And so by, you know, identifying multiple benefits to multiple species, we were able to find funding uh, through that uh, resource. We also took advantage of some mitigation credits that needed to be taken care of from the Utah Department of Transportation. They were doing some work near the project area and had it impact some wetlands. And we were able to hook up with them to get some funding for this, this project. Um, the Nature Conservancy did a lot with private donors, uh, and then we also got a lot of support from our Utah Endangered Species Mitigation Fund. Uh, they've been a huge supporter of this project as well. Um, phase three was just some plantings along some of the disturbed areas. Phase four was really the final phase of the project where we did some additional dredging, and then we also installed the pipeline. And once again, um, multiple funding sources uh, because we're benefiting, you know, waterfowl. We are able to tap into some federal aid money. We applied for some grants from Desert Fish Habitat Partnership, and we were able to be awarded there. Um, once again, DWR's Habitat Council threw in money, endangered species. And you just see the different partners that emerged as we thought broader than just uh, the individual species. And that brought more partners in and also brought additional funding. And that's just what has been awesome with this project is all the people who've collaborated, all the people who've provided funding and input into the project has been awesome. And in the end, it made it a much bigger project, a much better project than uh, we originally were uh, anticipating it trying to do. Um, so maybe just a little bit in summary, um, you know, what's made this successful um, was looking for opportunities to collaborate and partner with multiple groups. Um, as Jamie kind of mentioned, there's a lot of um, species out there that don't have a whole lot of funding for them. And that's what we really encourage through the initiative is let's partner up because as we partner up uh, and have multiple benefits to multiple species and habitats, it, it just opens the door for so many diverse funding sources to come open. Um, and as we've done that, we've seen a lot of benefit to a lot of those species that have a hard time finding funding sources for. And by just collaborating, uh, we resolved a, a lot of those issues uh, in the state of Utah. Um, so with that, thank you. I did put a link up here um, to a story map. If you want to know a lot more about this project, um, you can go ahead and find that on there. You can um, also find it on uh, the WRI website that I mentioned before as well. And you can kind of uh, dive into a lot more of the details of the project. Um, this was just kind of brought out for view of how we were able to get this project funded um, without using the, the typical um, funding sources that you would have thought of. So with that, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel and Jimmy. Uh, that was a great presentation. We've got a couple questions here that we'll go ahead and get started with. 
Um, the first one, um, Jimmy, during your presentation, which native species were incorporated in the threats table? Uh, for example, were the 277 species threatened by invasive and problematic all species of conservation need? Yeah, those, so we ran all of our SGCNs and all of our key habitats through the, what we call the threats calculator. So yeah, um, if it, uh, we had an earlier process to identify, like we ran all native wildlife through uh, basically the required, required element one process, like well, you know, what shall be your species of greatest conservation needs? So we, we whittled, you know, a thousand some down to like, you know, uh, 15 or 20 percent of that number and said, okay, these are SGCNs. So, so yeah, all, um, all SGCNs and key habitats were run through the, the threats, um, the threats machine. So that's, that's what those numbers are. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And this one is um, perhaps for both of you, uh, but Daniel, you talked about funding from different groups to address mandates. Uh, was the shared threats lexicon applied to this project? Um, just trying to con connect A, B, and C. Maybe I should save Daniel because <laughs> I know the answer. And I, I doubt he does. So, so yeah, it, it can be a little you know what came first, the chicken or the egg. So, so we we did the threat assessments back in you know 2014 or whatever, and and then those results. I walked up the hall and I said, "Hey, WRI guys." You know, can we can we can we put this into your program so you guys you guys use this? And so yeah, they did. But um, it's important to note that that those threat impact measures, you know, very high or low or whatever, I mean, that's for the entire statewide distribution of that of that species or habitat. It's not a ranking based on you know, it's not like in the project area. How bad is this? So. But again, I mean, it's a statewide program, a couple statewide programs. So we really, you know, I mean, it's trying to avoid like a, like a, you know, scramble competition for dollars, you know, by people just yelling louder, you know, well, right here, my thing is really important. And you know, like, well, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> so, so we don't do threat assessments in this whole program at the project scale. But what we do require is like, you know, is that project actually going to do something for that threat on the project area? You can't just say, well, it's a problem somewhere. Um, give me the points. Like, no, <laughs> if you're not touching it, you don't get it. If that, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Okay. We have a request for Daniel to review the slide where they were tracking progress in the web application. Is that something you can maybe share your screen again, Daniel? Is this the slide they're referring to? Um, I believe so. There's also... Um, the next slide that has the threats listed out as well. So yes, that's a slide. What was the question again? Um, just, I think just so, just to review it again, um, I'm not sure if there was a specific follow-up question to that, but maybe if you could just talk about that slide one more time. Yeah, so as, People propose project managers submit projects. Um, they have the opportunity to identify any of the different species or habitats. Um, I didn't really talk about habitats, but that is also here uh, as a, a button to click and do essentially the exact same thing for habitats. Um, but they can list any of the species that are, their project's gonna benefit. Um, and when they select the species, they then have to identify threats associated with them. Um, and obviously those are reviewed by different specialists to, as Jimmy just kind of make, said, make sure that they are uh, conforming to what that project is intending to do. Um, 
So they can't just list any threat that they want in order to get the points uh, associated with the species. But this allows us just to track that as well. And our whole database is queryable. So in the end, if I want to go back and say, well, what did we do for, you know, Razorback suckers since 2012 to 2021, the database is queryable, um, not only by us as administrators, but by, by anybody. And they can get on there and look at that and download the data. They can look at the different threats and threat impacts that are associated with each of the different species and, and take a look at that. So um, all these different agencies are you know, collaborating on that. And so a lot of the projects within Utah run through this system and is, has been huge, just even just tracking that information um, from project to project. So many times, you know, five years down the road, nobody knows where the project folder went. This allows us to track all of that from initiation of the project to completion of the project. You have to submit completion forms, uh, images and documents. So, you know, any photos, before photos, monitoring documents, NEPA documents can all be um, put on here as well as, you know, through the local working groups, they can make comments on projects back and forth as well um, on ways to improve the project. Um, they can have conversations back and forth between them as well, just to, to work through the project process, so. Awesome, thanks, Daniel. Okay, yeah, so we have, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. I was gonna say, um, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of social dynamic. I mean, it's competitive. Um, and, you know, collaboration is, is important, but, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you want your project funded. So, so there's a whole lot of keeping each other honest with this, that, that comments function. Um, that's where kind of, there's, there's in-person meetings or now with COVID virtual meetings, but, um, but the, the, the opening comment period opens up a few weeks before the, the, the meetings are held to, um, to discuss whether or not a proposal should be advanced to ranking. And then there's a whole ranking committee process too. But yeah, the, the, the back and forth is, uh, is uh, sporty. And uh, you know, we try not to have it let, let it get rowdy, but um, sometimes it does. But uh, mostly, yeah, it's like, you know, do you, do you deserve those points? Um, Cause it's all, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a point based system. And, you know, whoever gets the most points is more likely to, to get a payout. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's very social and um, yeah, it's cool. Gotcha. Yeah, that is really, really neat and a really unique system too. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask this question for you, Jimmy. And um, if along the way folks want to just unmute and follow up, um, that's okay in the amount of time that we have left. So the question is, do you feel a common threats lexicon is warranted nationally in all state wildlife action plans? Why or why not? Yes, I do. And in fact, uh, you know, it's vol voluntary best practices, but uh, well, for several reasons, like I said uh, in the slideshow, you know, every state has a natural heritage program. All of those natural heritage programs are running Biotics 5 in that Biotics 5 software package. They're all using the same threats lexicon that is recommended in the SWAPS best practices document. They also are all using the same threat impact calculation methodology, the scope and severity. So all of and, and also besides that, I mean, Biotics 5 does a good job of tracking like um, taxonomic changes and stuff. So you're calling the right, you know, the same critter, the same thing. Uh, so there shouldn't be any confusion there. And uh, in their, in their um, ranking methodology, it's mostly the weighting of the kind of algorithm is mostly based on um, uh, sort of abundance or distribution. So they, they track um, a, a lot of occurrence data. They, they actively seek out and, and warehouse and use in their rankings, they use occurrence data. So a lot of the surveys that you know, folks do, you can just send your heritage program um, the results. And so, I mean, it's, so yeah, there's really, there, there is no reason <laughs> to not use it. Um, I'm not really big on compulsion, but um, I mean, we're not here to mess around, right? This is not a social program. We're, we're doing conservation. Most of us are public employees. We're all managing the public stuff using their money. Let's do the best job we can. So there's, yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> 
Awesome. Good answer. <laughs> I'm going to back up Jimmy's answer a little bit just because it, it came from, a, from who it came from. But there's a couple leading examples in the Fish and Wildlife Associations of the Northeast and the Southeast. So CAFWA and NEAFWA to lead an effort for regional SGC enlists. And so this kind of effort that Jimmy's articulated could really streamline and help regional SGC enlist development and help states collaborate across boundaries to achieve conservation goals more broadly. They're talking the same language. They're talking about the same species. They've all agreed about the same priorities. Just It just makes everything smoother when you're talking across state agencies who before have had different priorities and different ways to measure things. Great. Got about two minutes left. Any other any immediate other, questions? Go for it. I was going to say any other brilliant ideas or thoughts before we close out here? Really appreciate the discussion, um, of course, but want to make sure we get done top of hour here. Thank you, Daniel. Awesome. Yeah, with that, let's go ahead and close it out. Um, I'm sure Jimmy and Daniel, uh, Drew and others would be happy to talk about this more offline if you'd like to and look forward to continued discussions on this in the community of practice as well. Um, so let me get back to my script here so I don't get lost. Um, so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us, especially thank you, Jimmy, Daniel, for preparing um, and being with us today and for your help in the case study that we're working to develop with you uh, for CCAST. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAST YouTube channel, uh, which Christy, I neglected to do that. So if you could drop those links in the chat, that would be great. Um, we are working on a full case study for the project that will be posted on CCAST sometime in the next month or two. Um, and you'll see that in the CCAST dashboard once it's ready to go. Um, we're also continuing to work on lining up speakers for the coming months. Um, we don't have our next, well, we have our fish, uh, Fishes of Texas webinar in late June. So if you're on our email list, you should have received that. If you haven't and want the information, just reach out to me or Christy and let us know. Um, and ditto for future webinar announcements for the non-native aquatic species community of practice. Uh, so with that final, thank you all for your time, Jimmy, Daniel, for your presentation. And we hope everyone has a great day.